Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to say a welcome to everybody that is here with us, as well as those that are joining us by Facebook Live. Uh, our order of service can be found at centenarychurch.com, uh, and as well as a link for contributing to the ministry of Centenary United Methodist Church. Allow me to share with you a couple of, uh, of announcements. First, I do need to share both a, a word of apology and a word of announcement regarding our church council meeting that is that will be tomorrow evening by Zoom. Uh, we will uh, we we are meeting. This is the regular time for the church council to meet. I apologize. I did not get that word uh, out earlier to everybody. I thought it really really hard and figured that was good enough. <laughs> Um, but uh, apparently we need a little bit better communication on that. I apologize. Uh, hope that you will be able to, to join us for that. The link has gone out. Uh, secondly, um, the, we had a, a group working through the book Cast uh, this, uh, this past fall. That group has decided to continue with another book and uh, we would invite you to consider being a part of the next conversation. Uh, we will be looking at the book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Our first time together will be the 16th of February. Uh, that will also be a, a virtual conversation. If you are interested in being a part of that, if you'll call the church office and let us know so that we can make sure you get the link, uh, the books should be in the office uh, this week. Lastly, allow me to share with you a gift that I would like to offer to any who are interested for the se as we head towards the season of Lent. And that is this book and uh, study guide entitled Info Unfolding Grace. It is 40 days of reading from the, uh, from the scriptures that guide you across the entire uh, scope of the scriptures. I believe, uh, I believe that uh, as, as God says in the, in the prophet Isaiah, my word will not depart from me and return to me empty. It will accomplish that for which I have sent it forth. And I believe that if we will spend time just simply being in the scriptures, that our spirits do grow. Um, these, uh, there are uh, copies of this in the office. They are free of charge. I would encourage you to pick one up. Um, I do ask if you pick one up that you actually use it. <laughs> Novel idea. There you go. There you go. And now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
I invite you all to share our greeting from Psalm 62 responsibly. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from God, who alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times, O people, pour out your heart before God, who lives a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. But they no confidence in extortion, set them only in hosts on robbery. In the riches and the riches, set not your once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, power belongs to God. And to you, O Lord, it belongs to the last love, for you repay all according to their work. Our hymn is God of Grace and God of Glory.
the third chapter of Jonah, beginning with verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim it to the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Our epistle is from the 11th chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 19 through 30. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast devotion. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were brought to the Lord. And Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. At that time, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine over all the world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. The disciples determined that according to their ability, each would send relief to the believers living in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke, the sixth chapter. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who persecute you, and for those, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from everyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again, but love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Please be seated. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, there's a rather famous description of preaching that the, the task of preaching is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. I have to tell you, I, I'm very aware that some measure of the series that we are drawing to a close here today has been afflicting for all of us, your pastor as much as any. Over these weeks at the beginning of the year, I. I felt like it would be a good time for us to spend a little bit of time thinking about and talking about money. Because we do have a great deal of money at our disposal. And because as I told you as we began, how we live with money says a great deal about the state of our soul. It speaks to the very reality of what really matters in our lives. Two weeks ago, I, I told you that the first principle, and one that we will return to again and again through this time, is that it's not your money. It's God's money. Last week, we talked about the idea that, uh, that we need to focus not on what we want, not on what we do not have but on what we do. And to be aware that a great many in our world do not have as we have. That's the place I want to return to again this morning. Because you see, there is a great deal of need in our world. According to End Hunger Now, every 3.6 seconds, someone dies from lack of food. That means that in an average worship service, 1,000 people are going to die while we await lunch, while we complain about the preacher droning on and on, talking again and again about money. That needs to matter to us. It needs to be a part of our faith. It needs to connect to what we do here in this place. Like no other faith in the world, the presence of suffering anywhere calls into question everything that we do here. Every single hungry child, every malnourished mother, every frightened father needs to matter to us. The book of James says religion that is pure cares for the widow and the orphan. Jesus said to the disciples, what you do for the least of these, you do for me. Somehow or other, at the very core of our faith is a connection between what we sing and say and pray here and what people experience in their everyday lives. And that needs to matter. As we draw this time of consideration of money to a close, I want to offer three principles that I think can govern our understanding of giving. First, it does need to matter. It needs to be a part of the choices that we make. In those very first years of the Christian faith, the, uh, the, the, the earliest people were, were driven across the empire by a persecution. And the very first people who were called by the name of Christian responded to the need that was there. We heard the story this morning in, in the book of Acts. The prophet stood up and declared that there was to be a famine, and the people of Antioch decided, as much as we were able, we will send relief. 
because that's who we are. We need to think about the poor before we think about ourselves. We need to consider the needs that surround us before we consider the desires that we have. John Wesley, the the historic founder of our Methodist way, wrote what he entitled an appeal to men of reason and religion. And in there, he, he spoke about our tendency to spend on ourselves, and he described it as robbing God and the poor, defrauding the fatherless and the widow, wasting the food of the hungry, and withholding God's raiment from the naked to consume it on our own flesh. Ouch. As I told the disciple class uh, this last Friday, uh, for one who spends as much as I do on myself, Mr. Wesley, you've done gone to meddling now. Gets right up in there. But you need to know that you can only spend a dollar one time. It may be able to multiply its impact on the world through what Adam Smith famously described as the invisible hand of economics, but you can only spend it one time. And that means that if I think I want a new set of golf clubs, I need to measure that desire against the 852 million people who right this minute are experiencing food insecurity. Our first obligation as people of faith is to care for the widow and the orphan. This is pure religion. Uh, To feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick and imprisoned. Because as you have done it to the least of these, you have done it for me. Second, I would offer to you that we quite likely should give more than we do. C.S. Lewis once wrote, I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, they are too small. There ought to be things that we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures exclude them. Again, ouch. If uh, we really love God, if we have really given our entire life to God, it should impact the choices that we make. It should pinch in the words of Lewis. There ought to be times where we choose others before ourselves. Now, my brothers and sisters, I believe that the most accurate statistic when assessing the giving within the life of a Christian congregation is what is known as the median annual gift. That is the middle gift. 50% give less, 50% give more. In 2020, The median annual gift of this congregation was $1,300. Now, uh, for some, that is a sacrifice. For some, that required hard choices. And if that is true for you, praise be to God for your faithfulness. But I am afraid that it is not for most of us. The average American family spends more than that to go on vacation every year, to go to restaurants. And the average American family spends just slightly less than that on coffee every year. Our choices in giving need to be something that challenges us. The first principle I gave to you is that it is not your money. And that the question we ought to ask is not how much do we give, but rather, 
How much do we take for ourselves? Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus said, give to everyone who asks. The third principle that I would give to you is just that. Give. Just give. You can give to the life of this Christian community. You can give in a thousand other ways. I can tell you that the church staff and the church leadership take very seriously our responsibility to care for what is in our care do the very most that we can. We take that seriously. Because we know that you are entrusting us. It seems to me, my brothers and sisters, that we spend altogether too much time trying to ask ourselves, will this be used in a way with which I agree? Will this be spent in a way in which I approve? Do I think that this is doing what I want? Jesus said, give to everyone who asks. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I would ask you, if you were in the position, what would you want? What would you ask? Do that. <clears throat> Many years ago, I, I took part in a mission trip to Ecuador. You've heard a great many stories about it. But this morning, I want to tell you an experience that I don't share frequently. That mission trip was the very first time in my life that I had gone on a mission trip. It was the very first time. But I actually saw people living in ways that I had read about in books. I was a naive 24-year-old who had lived what can only be described as a life of extreme privilege. And for the first time in my life, I saw people living in houses that didn't have plumbing, using an outhouse, a latrine. I saw people who had only the clothes on their back. And I met a, a young girl, 12 years old, I guess, I don't know. One day, she looked at this sweater that I was wearing I didn't even really like the sweater. She asked if she could have it. I said no. I took the sweater home. And I kept wearing it. I wore it till it wore out because I felt so guilty. I don't know whether she really needed it, but I'm very sure that I didn't. My brothers and sisters, I'm sorry. I know that this has been a hard series, but I think it's true. I think the things that I have shared with you over these weeks are in fact the truth of God. And I really do believe that we probably could do more. I'm sorry. But I know that the Lord God will take all that we offer and use it, multiply it, and magnify it. Amen.
Amen. Our hymn is We're Across the Crowded Ways of Life. apostolic faith. Let us now declare. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer ourselves to God and our gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ.
At this time, we'll have an opportunity to share any joys or any prayer requests that we have. We do have a few this morning that have been shared with me already. Uh, continued prayers for Ifu Rama. Um, prayers for Don and Roberta Pollock's son who passed away last week. We lift that family in our prayers. Continued prayers for Mark Anuber, for Kay Ragland, and we continue to lift up Don and Katie Hodges. Are there any other joys or concerns to share this morning? Paul. Uh, Michael, I would like to celebrate as a parent of a child the wonderful uh, week back in school. And <laughs> the teachers reporting uh, how wonderful it is to have the children back in the classroom and seeing the difference in the children. Pr praises for some of our parents in our congregation whose children went back to school this week and prayers for for others whose schools have not made it all the way back in yet but uh certainly prayers as we continue this transition as we as we are beginning to see a light at the end of this dark dirty tunnel that we've been in for nearly a year are there any others Joe. I've had, uh, you, you mentioned to me earlier that you've known several this past week, and I've known about five folks, in, including some family members in the past seven or eight days who have, who have gotten the virus. So we do continue um, to be cautious and to pray for those who are affected with this dreaded disease. Are there others? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God of everything that is, was, and will be, we are here today, grateful for all of your generosity. The tale this morning of Jonah reminds us of your never-ending love for all of creation. May we be like those people of Nineveh, who were able to recognize and acknowledge their sin, and were able to open their eyes to your healing presence. Lord, you've provided us with so much often more than we need or could use. Yet today many will go hungry. Many won't have a place to lay their heads tonight. Mothers and fathers will sleep in their cars or whatever temporary shelter they can find. And with their children in tow, they will use whatever means they can to feed their families. May your generosity towards us not be in vain. May we seek our hearts with you. And may we use your gifts of finances, of service, of love, grace, and mercy to lighten others' burdens. Through your guidance, may we offer ways of hope and grace through you that lead to fullness in life and in life eternal. Discipleship, Lord, is difficult for us. The will's there, but our humanness often holds us back from fully giving ourselves to you and your ways. Forgive us, patient and persistent Lord, for the many times we turn our backs on serving you and focus on serving ourselves and our own comforts. Forgive us when we look the other way when people are in need. Forgive our judgmental ways. Forgive our angry and apathetic attitudes and actions which lead to hurt beyond our realizations. Lord, wrap your arms around us, healing our own wounds and binding us to you. Wrap those whom we've hurt and help us find ways to reconnect, reconnect and reconcile with you as our center. As we've lifted before you the names of people near and dear to us who need your healing touch and your tender mercies, we ask that your illuminating presence and your tender compassion be present. Bring your healing to dark places and corners of our town and beyond that we're not even aware of. Our world is in the midst of strife, wars, oppression, famine, hunger, alienations, and situations which have abused your world. Heal us and heal this world, Lord. Renew us with your life-giving ways and let us go forth seeking to be people of peace, seeking to be people of mercy, and of building up one another in your name. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our closing hymn this morning, Forth in thy name, O Lord. <laughs>